Hello and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from UUW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. My name is Brigitte Kane Grady, and I'm a master's student studying trumpet performance with Jean Lawrence. Today, um, Jean will be sharing her vision for building new concert experiences to keep audiences engaged and share examples of her inter interdisciplinary work with music and film, theater, and multimedia art. Jean has been the trumpet professor here at UW-Madison for the past two and a half years, and is a member of the world-renowned all-female brass quintet, Seraph Brass. Jean holds degrees in trumpet performance and choral education from Northwestern University, studying primarily with Barbara Butler and Charlie Geyer, and her master's in artist diploma at Yale University studying with Alan Dean. From there, Jean spent years working in New York and Boston as a freelance artist and teacher, performing on Broadway and with artists such as Adele, the Hanson Brothers, the Boston Pops, and the Hong Kong Philharmonic. She also performs with The Knights, A Far Cry, Alarm Will Sound, and with Carnegie Hall's resident fellow chamber group, Ensemble Connect. Jean also does work with short films, integrating music, visual arts, and movement. You'll hear more about this later in her talk. Two of her recent projects, Koizumi and Descended, have drawn attention to her work not only from music, the music world, um, but also from people and foundations in the interdisciplinary arts. Her short film, Descended, recently won Best Music in the Hollywood International Golden Age Festival, and some of her multi multimedia work was chosen to be part of the Jason Museum's faculty performance series here on campus. Jean also plays with UW-Madison Brass Quintet, the Wisconsin Brass Quintet, which has recently begun to diversify its programming to include different types of music outside of standard brass quintet repertoire, I think largely due to her influence. Her excellent academic background, the extensive world touring she's done with her work, and her remarkable ability to communicate clearly and significantly to her students make her a real asset on the UW campus and to the students who are lucky enough to work with her. Jane's teaching caters to all of her students' unique places in their education and careers and helps them to develop the knowledge and best practices needed for careers in music while also working with them to develop in the specific areas of the field that they're most invested in. I know I can speak for the entirety of Jean's studio, the people who work with her, the people who learn from her outside of her trumpet teaching, when I say that she is invaluable to the School of Music and this university. Please welcome Jean Lawrence. Thank you, Virginia. That was so nice. Um, <clears throat> And it's been amazing to work with you for the past three years. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Brigine basically touched on a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm so excited to be here uh, and to share this virtual moment with you. Um, as Brigine mentioned, I am primarily a chamber music and or a chamber musician and an interdisciplinary artist. And today I'll talk about chamber music, where it came from, and one direction in which I think it could go, which is blending inter interdisciplinary arts into the genre. And uh, what are the interdisciplinary arts? Well, what is art? Um, a lot of people think of the stereotypic pillars of visual art sonic art or music, or the art of storytelling, which is theater. And um, I actually take a bigger definition of art, which really only has needs for components. So most of you listening are probably an artist in some form, whether or not you define yourself that way. Because all you need to create an art is creativity, a set of skills or a skill, uh, a sense of producing, uh, a desire to produce a sense of meaning, and some sort of public facing element. Sometimes in music we call this entertainment, but something that offers something to the public. So the four components again, creativity, skill, meaning, and some sort of public offering. 
And so with my chamber music, I uh, have worked with uh, the culinary arts, with storytelling, the art of child's play, the visual arts, dance, and the theatrical arts. And I thought I'd give you a little sampling of the kind of work that I'm going to be talking about and the kind of projects that I'm doing now before I try to dive too deeply or overdefine anything. So why don't we go ahead and watch uh, a, some vignettes from a performance piece that I recently created. This is file number one. So that piece is called Koizumi, and it is, as I'm sure you saw, very interdisciplinary, where it was combining its part chamber music, part visual art, visual projection art, and part theatrical staging, where the staging, um, while it is uh, not intricate movement, it's not dance, uh, there is a meaning behind the movements, uh, and it's woven into the narrative. And that piece was created in 2019, and it's inspired by the Euro-American Japanese writer Lafcadio Hearn, who is also my great great uncle. So he lived in the 19th century, but uh, he's not only well known globally, but has also a sort of part of a family story for me. Um, he is most remembered for his creation and transcriptions of uh, ghost stories, specifically Japanese ghost stories. But he was also a journalist and he lived all over the globe and he wrote about racial inequities, police brutality, and we're talking about the 1870s. Um, he documented 
unwritten voodoo folk songs, Japanese ghost stories, global folk traditions, and his uh, documentation of underrepresented global cultures along with their endangered spirit worlds makes him somebody who's very topical and uh, worth revisiting and remembering um, because he's concerned, he was so concerned with preserving cultural customs that he felt were threatened by white Western society and industrialization. And um, Within the performance piece, there are eight individual pieces of music, and they're all each inspired by a different piece of Lafcadio Hearn's writing. Some of them were journal entries, some of them were stories within books. Um, and we, the visuals were mapped to our movements and to the sound, so it, uh, it blends together in this beautiful uh, sonic visual experience that um, we had so much fun premiering at the Harvard Art Lab. But unfortunately, this was in October of 2019. So come early 2020, we um, enter into the new year and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, we have a pandemic. So we unfortunately haven't be, been able to take this performance beat out into the world, but we're working on early 2022, maybe even late 2021. And uh, we were also originally going to create a visual album. I'm very inspired by Beyonce and Childish Gambino um, and the work that they do in the visual album, visual co combining um, sort of music videos with their pieces to tell a story. Um, but due to the closing down of the studios we were gonna use, we had to forego our plans to make a visual album, which ended up being a happy accident because um, we were already a little bit tripped up about how we take these eight individual pieces of music because the visual album was going to pull the music from the performance piece and how we uh in a digital way create a, a through line narrative that doesn't feel interrupted with the ending of each song or each piece um, and so what we ended up doing we had to change the way in which we uh, created the visual art we ended up making a film and it, it's a short experimental art film that pulls music from the performance piece but weaves it together in a way that involves a lot of sound design uh, to create a 27 minute film whose narrative is mostly fleshed out abstractly through music but there are quotes written by Lafcadio peppered in throughout the film and so um i'm going to show you the trailer of the film just so you can see how much of an artistic shift we wound up making from the performance piece so we can play the descended trailer which is file number two So that was the trailer for the film Descended, which actually recently premiered in the Wisconsin Film Festival. And um, both the performance piece, which is called Koizumi, and the film called Descended are part of the same umbrella project, which I'll talk more about later. Um, but there actually is going to be a film screening here in Madison in late October. If you're interested in seeing the film, it's uh, nothing is set in stone. But if you actually follow me on uh, social media, you can f I'll be posting regularly about updates. It's likely going to be on October 28th at Working Draft Brewery, but it's not confirmed. So my handle is at Jean Lawrence if you're interested in uh, coming to say hi and seeing the full version of the film. 
um, both of the projects that you saw, of, of course I had collaborators. I'm not normally a filmmaker, um, nor am I a digital projection artist. So I worked with Masari Studios and I worked with 410 Media for the film. And all along I worked with composer, creator, Maria Finkelmeyer to uh, build the concept of these two pieces. And both of the pieces involved chamber music. They uh, had trumpet and voice. I was on both trumpet and vocals. And then uh, percussion and um, some digital sounds and then um, um, a few other uh, smaller instrumental percussion instruments woven in there as well. Um, but they were in their purest form, they were chamber music that weave elements that are that I feel are relevant to the continuing innovation of the field that is chamber music, which I'm going to talk about. But first, what is chamber music and what is the story behind it? Um, there's a spectrum of de definitions, but uh, Paul Berry has a really uh, great one that I like, which is um, simply put, chamber music is people in a room performing music with and for each other. So in that sense of the definition, chamber music has been around since the origin of the sapien species. We have always produced organized sound together in uh, as a way to show a sense of higher meaning and purpose whether through vocal chants or through um, drumming or through the creation of instruments through organic materials. Um, a fun side fact, since I'm a trumpet player, I like to geek out about the earliest metal brass trumpets were actually discovered in King Tutankhamun's tomb. So um, the craft that we've been doing has been around for so long, but we have a more contemporary conservatory style definition of chamber music which if you type into, when I type into my YouTube browser, chamber music concert, I tend to get a very specific thing, which is small groups of people performing music, usually without a conductor in a staged concert, oftentimes performing music by dead people, not always, but often, um, or sometimes chamber music is offered for public services, like a string quartet in a wedding or a local band at a festival small groups of musicians playing music with and for each other. Um, and like any genre, chamber music can't really be, it has to be defined only in hindsight. After weaving together a series of trending threads through to make a braided definable whole. And so asking what chamber music is, is much like trying to define the exact origin of jazz and it, distill what jazz is down into a two sentence answer because there are millions of individual elements that went into the creation of jazz and individual threads that contributed to the way in which we now consider the genre based on um, trending events within the field but also uh, sociological shifts in culture and that is really really important and i'm going to be talking more about that today um, we have we tend to have organic innovation and development within any genre and then paradigm shifting innovation. So for example, a paradigm shift for jazz was happened around the great world wars when we have humans moving all over the globe, sharing their music. And so now we have this global event that's creating a paradigm shift and spreading the, um, the genre, which is then having its own organic developments within each pockets of the globe. So uh, going back to the more contemporary, the classical contemporary version of what we think of as chamber music, um, it's essentially an offering of a concert with a small group of people, usually attended by people who pay some money and have uh, an appreciation for the skill that goes into it, it which is it can be thought of as sometimes a, a more connoisseur culture, one that takes years to develop, not only in the playing of chamber music, but also in the listening to of it. Um, but it wasn't always this way. Prior to the 19th century, if I got an invitation to a chamber music, to hear chamber music, I'd be least likely to think of specific instruments that I would go hear or the specific composer that I'd be hearing. But instead, I'd be thinking of the room that the music would be played in and, and the purpose of the evening's events. And uh, chamber music was really uh, founded within two major institutions, one being the church, the earliest 
written Western classical music came from Gregorian chant, uh, which was thought to be um, the sound of the angels speaking. And that developed into a series of, of innovations that created sacred music. And then also in the wealthy, in wealthy patronism, we had um, uh, the aristocracy or uh, royalty hiring their own staff composers to basically create their personal playlists. And so it's not surprising with these two main institutions that we have a lot of music from our classical tradition um, focused around church music like masses and cantatas um, or music for the wealthy back in the 18th century, 17th century. And so we get a lot of dance music. Um, chamber music was played out in the gardens. It was played in special, beautiful rooms that were designed solely for music performance. And it was a way to sort of socially flex your prestige and ability. And um, so chamber music was really born out of, of these two veins in the Western classical sense that we think of. But there was another major paradigm shift that affected the innovation of chamber music, and that was European rev revolution, the rise of nationalism, and the loss of patronism or the wealthy aristocracy supporting staff musicians and composers. We then had an increase of the middle class who were able to buy instruments for their home um, and able to purchase published music. So someone like Haydn, who's a famous classical composer, he started by working for a prince and he spent many years creating the music that the prince um, had asked him to create. Um, but then he also used his smaller groups, his chamber music groups, as a way to workshop and experiment his personal compositions because there's no cheaper way to uh, experiment with your writing style than to have a small number of musicians who can make quick changes. Um, and you don't have to hire a full orchestra. Um, so we have the rise of the middle class, we have more people playing instruments, and then Haydn was suddenly able to publish his own music and make a living as a sole proprietor. And so he, he lived a very interesting life in, in between this major paradigm shift. And uh, then there was more exposure to music, more interest in it. And then we have the growth of the public concert uh, by the early 1800s. Um, and, and that's where we really, the late 1700s, the 1700s and the 1800s is where we define chamber music as we think of it today when we're studying music in school. And from there, we had a series of organic innovations. We have another major paradigm shifting innovation happening now, but um, the organic innovations that happened from the mid 19th century um, were the rise of of and development of instruments. So, for example, the trumpet, as it uh, exists today, really only came to fruition by the early 19th century. Um, and so the trumpet in orchestra, its primary role in the classical period was to sit in the back with the timpani and produce a lot of volume and a lot of uh, harmonic support. And so the trumpet got a stereotype of being a very loud instrument. And sometimes when I hold my trumpet up to little kids, they tend to do that. Um, but the trumpet, uh, actually I have here, I don't know, this is a Baroque trumpet. Um, you can see uh, I, I can I need to use holes to make the sound. And so I wasn't really able to play a lot of different kinds of notes. I wasn't able to play chromatically with this instrument, but with the invention of valves, I'm able to play chromatically. So that was an important organic in innovation that happened, that now I'm able to play more melodically. And then we have the birth of new types of chamber groups. It started mostly with the string quartet, um, but we have now the brass quintet that was founded uh, in as late as 1940. That's not necessarily true, but that's when it kind of hit the ground running. And we have the wind quintet with which Alicia talked about in her Wingra Badger talk as well. And so um, with these innovations, we get more groups and we get more people, but it's still sort of set in this genre that we have defined through the trajectory of these organic innovations and then the, the huge shift that happened in Europe. So I'm going to play an example of what is a, a piece of chamber music for you by Seraph Brass, and it's a combination of a contemporary um, and maybe more traditional 
work of chamber music, and I'll explain why later. So this is um, file number three, which is Hungarian Rhapsody number two by Liszt. <laughs> So that was Hungarian Rhapsody number two uh, by Franz Liszt. It was not originally written for the brass quintet. It was written for the piano. And so it's contemporary in the sense that uh, the brass quintet is playing, which is a relatively new genre or subgenre within the world of chamber music. But it's traditional in the sense that the piece that you're hearing was originally written in 1847. It was written for the piano. And so a lot of what um, brass quintet players do is we we commission new music um, and there's some great stuff out there but we also steal a lot of music from the favored classical and romantic composers who didn't write as much for brass 
Um, earlier I mentioned that there is another large paradigm shifting moment that is happening right now, which is the digital boom. And that is greatly informing the kind of projects that I do and the type of work that I do. Because um, there are three really huge elements that are different now than they were 50 years ago. One of those elements is the changing of our sensory exposure on a daily basis. So especially our youth, they're used to interacting with screens and screens are inherently multi-sensory. So they're used to engaging in a, a visual connection with the sound um, and then also some interactive uh, display elements on the screen itself, on the tablet or the phone. So that's a big shift in our human experience. We also have a huge new sound palette, which is that of digital instruments. A huge percentage of the pop music that we hear on today's radio uh, contains instruments that aren't actually real physical instruments. They were created on a computer. They are, it's a digital sound palette. So now we have all of these new sonic colors to work with. And then finally, with the internet, we have a lot more exposure. So we it's easier to deeply blend the, the genres. And um, uh, the groups that I've worked with, Maria Finkelmeyer, the composer uh, that I worked with to create these two projects, we actually are put putting out an album. It drops on September 24th, if you want to check it out on streaming services. It's called Descended, just like the film. And we had a really hard time defining the genre because there are jazz elements, there are a lot of classical elements, there are um, global sound elements, um, and it's just really hard to pigeonhole uh, what the genre of this album is because there's so much genre blending happening these days. So the three biggest new things that we have to work with in contemporary music making is um, multi-sensory expectations a lot of times, uh, digital sound palettes, and then genre blending through uh, exposure globally because of the internet. And so I wanted to work with these three elements to create my projects. and. Um, I wanted to mix these three elements with things that have stood the test of our history and time. So I thought about art forms that have always done well, or um, not only art forms, but, but different types of art or reasons for art making. And so I thought about the idea of a narrative. Narrative has always done well, what be it visual narrative painted on a cave or the huge boom of opera, which was the major block busting art form uh, for many centuries. And it was, it's still alive and well, but it, it was replaced in popularity with the creation of films. We had silent films and then uh, the film industry has just developed into this incredible beast and it's doing really well in, uh, the, in global cultures. Um, and it's because all of these things combine multi-sensory narrative influenced elements. Um, and then there's also the uh, connection to the deepest parts of our musical traditions, which is using music to connect to some sort of sublime or some sort of supernatural. So this is why um, this was basically weaving together the new things that we have going on in this recent digital boom mixed with the uh, time tested use of narrative and connecting to some sort of um, super natural power. Uh, those were the elements that went into the creation of the film. And I want to show you a little bit more of the film. I know you've seen the trailer, but I'm going to read you the description and you will hopefully hear the inclusion of the elements that I was just speaking of, because I truly believe that this is one strong direction that, uh, we can go in as artists, as performers, as musicians, and for those of us who are students, we can kind of shift our lens towards this direction too. And I'm not saying it's replacing uh, the preservation of our beautiful history, but I, I do think that there is a market and a want for this kind of art. So I'll share a little bit more about the film, um, uh, and then I'll show a little bit more of it to you. So the description that we have for the film reads this. This 27 minute film is an abstract ghost story inspired by the life and work of Lafcadio Hearn, an overlooked 19th century writer and cultural preservationist. Hearn's examinations of race, 
marginalized spiritual communities and the beautiful strangeness of humankind re remain resonant today, 150 years later. Riddled with Hearn references, the film weaves thematic materials, quotes, and metamorphic vignettes from his haunted life and morbid imagination. Side note, he was a really interesting, intense, and weird dude. <laughs> um, the film highlights his fascination with Buddhist inflected ghost stories and symbols. The music forms a narrative engine as the artists uncover Hearn's philosophies on eternal memory, infinite wisdom, and supernatural interference. And so the film really is a, a story about, it's a ghost story about transitions. And you'll see me, I'm the main character in the film, um, and you'll see, you, if you come to see the live screening of the film, you'll see me descend deeper and deeper into some sort of paranormal space. I'm gonna show you the intro of the film now, but as you watch later, you'll see me interacting with weird ghostly uh, uh, effects. And I there's like a, a crazy uh, moment with a ghost behind a curtain and there's a crazy underwater scene. So I definitely hope that you come check it out. Um, and the, the hope for the film, the outcome goal, is to create a sort of meditative space for people to ponder what the word supernatural means to them. For a lot of people, it is it can be a religion, or it's a belief in le legends or superstitions, or it's your own individual interpretation of what the beyond is. And it's about the coming together of our real physical sphere with that of our supernatural sphere. It's a very... Um, big part of what the human experience is, is this, uh, this uncanny fear of the supernatural. And it's a space to wonder what it might look like if these two spheres came together. And the film is also a story of lineage. Some of the themes in Lafcadio Hearn's writings are uh, about infinite memory and eternal life and uh, the sense of subconscious inherited wisdom. And so with me as the descendant of the Hearn bloodline and uh, the primary figure in the film, the film is purposefully ambiguous about whether I am going into my own post-life transition, whether I'm having a transcendental lineal flashback or if I'm re-experiencing Hearn's inherited psychodrama through the bloodline that I hold. So why don't we show a part of the film Descended, which is file number four.
so that was the beginning of the film descended i had spoken about um the coming together of two spheres the real physical world and more supernatural elements and uh, what you've seen so far is mostly me in the beginning stages of being in the real physical world but there are some creepy hyper supernatural elements that you see and then as we go more deep into the film it just gets absolutely insane it is a ghost story there is one little jump scare but it's mostly just a space to kind of ponder the beauty inside the darkness um, that is our fear of something much much bigger um so we also uh this is as i mentioned earlier a tangent of the performance piece and i'll show a little of the performance piece now as well because um i want to show how in some ways it's quite different but in a lot of ways it is the same there is this similar pondering of these two spheres and how they come together differently for everybody. Um, and I want to show you a portion of one of the pieces and, and gear your eye towards the snare drum. So the snare drum actually plays a, a role. It is a character in the live performance piece and it's, it's only played and interacted with during pinnacle moments where we are crossing the membrane from our real physical world into that of the supernatural. So I'll show the next clip, which is number five. And uh, we'll just watch this for a few minutes and you can kind of see uh, where the one of the spheres exists inside of the snare drum and there's another one projected onto the wall. And you can just absorb whatever it means to you. performance piece and I just want to demonstrate a little bit of how we're working with uh, digital sound with interdisciplinary arts or multi-sensory elements and then also and then also um, working in uh, some genre blending and uh, using all of this to try to create a narrative and a sense of higher meaning uh, and allowing audience members to um, abstract whatever they wish out of that so I think the biggest thing that will change about the way we bring art to our audiences is not actually the type of art that we create, although the type of art that I'm working inside of is sort of forward pushing. Um, I think it's more how we are delivering what we are making to audiences. 
Um, I like to make a connection to Hamilton. Uh, Sarah Marty had a really great Badger talk where uh, she, in it, she talks about um, how Hamilton brings together hip hop and contemporary music with American history, history with musical theater. And I think that's gonna be happening a lot. And it, it's very, very popular and I, I see it working really well. And um, a big concern in the classical music world is how to get more audience members. Um, I used to do a fellowship program at Carnegie Hall and the administration at Carnegie Hall was always asking, how do we get more butts in seats? But I wonder if maybe that's not uh, the, the right question to ask. Maybe it's how do we repackage and re-deliver the art so that it goes to the people? And uh, what we're doing with these two projects, as I mentioned earlier, Descended and Koizumi are both a part of a bigger umbrella project where we are uh, trying to create, we call it Rubik's Cube art, where it's a shape-shifting piece of art that can take really any form. It can be a chamber music, it can be a performance art piece, it can be a film, it can be um, a storytelling event with some music where we share stories written by Lacadio Hearn. And we're even going to turn it into a visual soundscape installation that can be brought to museums or uh, gardens. Um, and the hope is that we create something that is, as I said, shape-shifting for any venue. And we're really, by we, I mean the people I work with, my collaborators, and uh, what I'm doing in my research. I want to see uh, which of these entry points creates the strongest connection for the public and how we can use these connections to inform the type of creating and more importantly, the type of delivery delivery we offer. Um, and I also wonder what this might look like in our training, in the training of future artists. Uh, as a teacher, this is a really curious topic of conversation. I always wonder what changing the word chamber music into the word chamber arts might look like from a student perspective. What if we, uh, instead of mixing small groups of musicians together, mix a couple musicians with a ceramic artist, a dancer, a playwright, or you know, a, a basket weaver with a harpist and then a digital animator. What kinds of products would we produce? I think it would be really, really interesting because they would have access to all of this contemporary stuff, the digital soundscapes and uh, infinite genres. Um, and also, uh, they could probably um, break out of the what can become a sort of echo chamber where we just repeat the traditional pieces of the past and then we become professors and we teach those pieces to our students. And, and by mixing art forms, genres, and bringing in technology to the mix, I think we can really um, offer a really a, an, a, an innovative and exciting form of art for the future of what we consider to be arts training and chamber music. So thank you so much for listening in. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, please throw them into the chat. And thank you for letting me share this moment with you. Jean, thanks so much uh, for sharing your art with us. And though some of those clips were just so mesmerizing, uh, really um, captivating. We had a couple of comments in the chat too. This is intense from Constantino. <laughs> um, and you also, have, of course, had a bravo. Hello, everybody. Fran Paleo, Moyer Badger Talks producer. Do please feel free to post some questions in the chat for Jean. Uh, so Jean, you touched on this a little bit at the end uh, of your presentation, but as we see you in these films, your actress as well as musician, is that something also you're encouraging for students to be in multi-talented is what it really is. Obviously we, as musicians, you think of your, your one craft and your instrument and, you know, maybe as a, as a alto player, you also play tenor, but you're not usually branching off into all these different genres, right? So can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that looks also for your studio and, and students in the future? Sure, I'm definitely not encouraging all of my students to become actors as well as perform as music performers, but in a sense you are, you are on stage sharing something. And we do talk a lot about body position and the way you express yourself physically and what you say about a piece of music. But what I'm encouraging people to do is to tap into any interest that they have and weave it into their music making. Um, so I've had, uh, you know, Brigine, who you saw, she loves um, 
Irish and Scottish folk music and she sings and she dances. So she's done a lot of projects where she brings all of those things together and she creates and curates her own arrangements. And I recently have a grad, a graduate student who, or a student who graduated, um, who was a dancer. And I have another dancer right now. And I have a lot of people who are mixing and um, bringing together different art forms. But you know, here's another example. I like to rock climb and I like to hike. And you could, if you're a musician and you're a hiker, you could get a drone pilot to follow you up a mountain and you perform a little ditty on top of the mountain. You can take any interest of yours, weave it together with whatever art form you do and create something genuinely interesting because it has more than one sensory involved. And so that's what I'm, that, the multi-sensory part is what I'm really pushing. That's really fascinating. Uh, now, talk a little bit about the pandemic. So as an avid classical music listener, I was really excited in some ways, of course, double-edged sword. But during the pandemic, you see the New York Philharmonic live streaming, uh, and you can access that. There was just an abundance of cool things, um, including like the ballet companies doing little vignettes, trying to engage audiences no longer local, right? It can be international. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on the pandemic and how did that impact reach uh, for musicians and artists? Yeah, so like anything, uh, a hurdle that we experience in encourages innovation. And so we all had to get used to creating digital art if you're an artist um, or taking whatever you do and finding a way to get it out there digitally because that was really one of the only options outside of performing outside um, and i think my biggest takeaway is that uh, is one of access and exposure we can bring our art to more people than we ever thought we could and i'm really excited about the potential hybrid options of sharing what it is that we do I'm really excited to get back on stage and to be sharing music intimately with real three-dimensional humans. But um, I also am excited about the live stream option that we now have at the Mead Witter School of Music, where you know, my, my DMA student, he's from Brazil, his family's in Brazil. They can now watch, easily watch his recitals. And um, I'm also excited about the technological chops that we all develop. Um, and have had to develop. Brigitte, Brigitte mentioned, you know, the shifting of the Wisconsin Brass Quintet. And I will say, actually, I think the biggest influ influencer of that shift was Mark Hetzler, who also gave a Badger talk um, because he has a lot of chops with technology in mixing digital sounds with, with sounds. Actually, the whole brass area here at UW um, now has a lot of experience with that. And that's been so fun. So, uh, basically, I'm excited for the three things I was speaking about, the, the ability to share and the ability to mix and match digital uh, techniques and technologies into the what we create. Yeah, and I just have to say that performance of the Liszt uh, Hungarian Rhapsody with the quintet, wow, like great technical abilities and chops in addition to just lively performance. So thanks again for sharing that with us. We do have another comment or question here from Constantino. I like the idea that, quote, butts in seats shouldn't always be the goal, especially in these socially distant times. Do you see the role of the venue changing going forward? And if so, how? That's a really good question. Um, well, what if we just eliminated the seats? You know, I'm really interested in um, changing venues in a way that allow for more comfortable seating at the very least. Um, I, especially after a pandemic now, when I go to a beautiful hall, I am a little concerned to go back to a space where you have hundreds and hundreds of people crammed together and you can't really move. And then people shush you if you're trying to open something. Um, but meanwhile, really successful are like the Ravinia concerts and the outdoor spaces where orchestras can perform um, at Tanglewood. It's really successful. And so what if we brought that inside? What if we, I, I have this idea and hope for um, a BYO Yo concert, bring your own yoga mat. And just, you can kind of bring your own pillows and just kind of lay down and, and make yourself comfortable. Um, and, and maybe even just readjusting how we experience our, our inside of a concert hall. Uh, we, we could have a different entry point into the music that we're offering as well. Um, but 
also with accessibility, um, not everybody can get to these big venues that sometimes cost a lot of money to go to. So again, the hybrid nature of how things are going is a really exciting innovation. That's a genius, Jean. I'm picturing <laughs> recliners and the free popcorn. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so let's see, I have two other questions for you. Can you talk just a little bit for maybe some of our younger musicians who are just getting started? Can you tell us how you got started and why trumpet? Sure. Um, I've always been drawn to high soprano instruments. Um, I played violin first and then I started trumpet and I, I didn't have any sort of magical special treatment starting. I started with my local band in school um, and it was it shifted between being an artistic experience for me and as a young girl, it was very social. I was very interested in band for the community aspect of it. Um, and I happened to love playing music and um, I was drawn to a specific kind of music. Um, so I, I picked the trumpet. I was just interested in all the high soprano instruments. So I picked the trumpet because there were two openings and I, my best friend, my, who was my neighbor, we decided that we we're going to practice hard and try to get first and second chair so we could sit next to each other. And the trumpet spot, the trumpet section had two openings. So it, it's not a really like beautiful, magical start. It's, it's more of a just two friends wanting to sit next to each other and stir up some mischief. <laughs> awesome. I love that. Can you tell us now this one, you might have to ponder about a minute and sorry to spring it on you. <laughs> what is your favorite live performance of all time? Either, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be in a concert hall, anything. Mm. Uh, I mean, I can think of two answers off the top of my head. Um, three, actually. I went to a snarky puppy concert that I was just blown away by back when I was really hardcore into the classical scene only. And it kind of, it kind of ripped open my realization of uh, genre blending. Um, um, two brass area colleagues, Mark Hetzler and Tom Curry, created a piece called Don't Look Down that was, uh, I think it was in 2019, um, that came to, that they produced and uh, shared in Madison. And that was just a moment for me where I saw them interacting with the digital sounds and huge shift for me um, in the context of my life. And then I saw, I got to see Hamilton live on Broadway with the original cast and it was before it really blew up. So um, I was really lucky to sneak in there in a way that didn't break the bank. Um, and I just blew, it blew me away. It was the type of Fantastic. art that you leave, you leave asking more questions than you came with. And that's a sign of a good concert when you, or a good art, you leave with more questions than you came with. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jean, for leading the pack in this area as well. Uh, here in Madison and on our campus, uh, really appreciate your work and your art, and we look forward to seeing future things uh, from you in your in your genre that you're working in. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks so much, everybody. So we will continue our awesome Meadwater School of Music series of talks. Uh, please join us next Tuesday, September 21st at noon. We're going to be talking to Johannes Wallman, who's our director of jazz studies. And he's going to be talking about his most recent album, Elegy for an Undiscovered Species, and how jazz composition really creates a framework for performers' improvisation. Also, uh, check out uh, our Badger Talks Live podcast just launched today. Johannes did an interview with Ben Rush, and you can find that on our badgertalks.wist.edu website. There you can also see our upcoming schedule of talks, sign up for our email list. Please consider a donation. Badger Talks is supported by a grant. And we also have a roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff that are signed up to give talks all around the state. Thanks for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.